From heavenly angels to enigmatic creatures, the Bible is filled with fascinating characters that have captured our imagination for centuries. Who are these mysterious beings, and what roles do they play in biblical stories? Join us in this video to know the Bible's top 10 most mysterious beings. From heavenly messengers to supernatural entities, we'll unravel the mysteries behind these intriguing figures. The Orphe. Angels are mentioned many times in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Exodus. Moses, the Israelites' leader, encountered angels while they were wandering in the wilderness. Another interesting term mentioned in ancient Hebrew is ophanim, which refers to wheels. The wheels described in Ezekiel's vision of God's throne are particularly intriguing. Ezekiel had a vision where he saw a dark cloud with lightning and fire coming from the north. Within this cloud were four bright beings, later identified as cherubim. Ezekiel also saw wheels, like chariot wheels, which could move in any direction without turning. These wheels were described as sparkling with eyes all around their rims. Ezekiel noticed that wherever the cherubim went, the wheels went too. This showed a constant interaction between them, guided by the Spirit of God. The multiple eyes on the wheels represented God's complete awareness and omniscience, meaning He knows everything. This vision marked the beginning of Ezekiel's prophetic journey, where God called him to be a spokesman and a watchman for the Hebrew exiles. It's important to remember that this vision was symbolic and visionary, not literal. While it may seem bizarre to modern readers, it conveyed profound spiritual truths and messages to Ezekiel and his audience. Seraphim Seraphim are special beings created by God to serve and worship Him. These fiery, six-winged angels are always present around God's throne. The prophet Isaiah shares a vivid vision of these creatures in Isaiah 6. They are described as having six wings, covering their faces and feet with two, and using the remaining two to fly. Isaiah's vision unveils a heavenly scene where God is seated on His exalted throne, surrounded by seraphim. These angelic beings worship God continually and serve as agents of purification. Isaiah himself experienced their purifying touch as they cleansed him of his sins before he embarked on his prophetic ministry. The term seraphim appears exclusively in Isaiah 6, emphasizing their fiery nature. The word is derived from a Hebrew verb meaning to burn with fire or destroy with fire, hinting at their role as purification agents. While these angels are created sinless, they are not divine like God. Isaiah's vision illustrates the seraphim's close proximity to God and their revelatory praise. When they proclaim, the whole earth is full of His glory, it reflects their perspective from heaven. This divine perspective reveals God's infinite, indescribable, and powerful glory that transcends realms and saturates the earth. The seraphim's reverence for God is evident in their triple invocation of holy to describe God's sacred nature. This reverence is a reminder for us, imperfect creatures, to approach God with humility and respect. In Revelation 4, a similar scene unfolds with living creatures around God's throne crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Besides worship, the seraphim also plays a role in purification. Upon recognizing his unworthiness before God, Isaiah saw the seraphim covering themselves in humility. One of them took a burning coal from the altar and touched Isaiah's lips, symbolizing the atonement of his sins. This act assures Isaiah that his guilt is taken away, the behemoth. Imagine a massive African elephant charging towards you, its trunk outstretched, its eyes wide, and its powerful legs thundering on the ground. There's nothing between you and this giant beast except flat grass, and your heart is racing with fear. But did you know there were once creatures that were even mightier and more fearsome than elephants roaming the earth? These creatures, called behemoths, are mentioned in the book of Job. Job, a wealthy and righteous man, faced unimaginable suffering when Satan challenged God about his loyalty. Despite losing his wealth, family, and health, Job remained faithful to God. He questioned the fairness of his suffering and longed for answers from God. 
Eventually, God spoke to Job, reminding him of his power and wisdom. In the midst of this conversation, God describes the behemoth, a creature of immense strength and size. Scholars debate whether the behemoth was an elephant or a hippopotamus, but its description in the Bible emphasizes its power and dominance in the animal kingdom. This creature, created by God, showcases his awe-inspiring creativity and authority over all living beings. The behemoth reminds us of God's sovereignty and the limitations of human understanding. Just as Job couldn't contend with the mighty behemoth, we too must recognize the greatness and mystery of God's creations. The cherubim. Cherubim are celestial beings created by God. They appear in the Bible immediately after Adam and Eve's expulsion from the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3 recounts their disobedience and expulsion from paradise, with cherubim stationed to guard the way back to the Tree of Life. This symbolizes humanity's separation from God's presence due to sin. Cherubim plays a significant role in biblical imagery. They represent heavenly guardians and the divine presence. They are depicted as powerful beings with wings, hands, and eyes, symbolizing their watchfulness and wisdom. In Ezekiel's vision, cherubim are described as having wheels within wheels, indicating their supernatural nature. Despite their intimidating appearance, cherubim also symbolizes God's mercy and mediation. They allow the high priest access to the holy place in the temple, representing humanity's connection to God through sacrifice. In Christian belief, cherubim assures believers of access to God's presence through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. In contrast, the figure of Lucifer, introduced in Isaiah 14, represents pride and rebellion against God. Lucifer, meaning morning star or light bringer, was originally depicted as a magnificent deity but fell from grace due to his desire for power and glory. Melchizedek Now, let's talk about someone special in the Bible, a person named Melchizedek. He's a bit of a mystery. You see, Melchizedek lived during the time of Abraham a long time ago. Even his name sounds mysterious, doesn't it? But why do people talk so much about him? Well, let's find out. In the Bible, names aren't just names. They have meanings. For instance, Adam's name meant of the earth because he was made from the earth. In Hebrews 7.2, Melchizedek's name means king of righteousness. It tells us he was a fair and just ruler. That's pretty important. Melchizedek is like a symbol for Jesus, who's also known as the king of peace. Now in Genesis 14, we learn more about Melchizedek. He met Abraham after a big battle and gave him bread and wine. That's cool, right? But here's the big deal. Melchizedek was a priest of God Most High. That means he served the one true God, whom Abraham also worshipped. Melchizedek blessed Abraham, showing respect for God's power. What's really interesting is that Melchizedek's priesthood is compared to Jesus' priesthood in the New Testament. Hebrews 6.20 says, Jesus is like Melchizedek, a high priest forever. That's a big deal. And Hebrews 7 talks a lot about Melchizedek. It says he had no beginning or end, like Jesus. That's pretty mysterious, don't you think? Abraham, who's a big deal in the Bible, respected Melchizedek a lot. He even gave him a tenth of all the stuff he got from battle. That's a sign of respect. And get this, Melchizedek didn't have a family tree or any records of when he was born or when he died. He's like a shadow of Jesus, showing us that Jesus is an even greater priest. Melchizedek's city, Salem, means peace. It's like a picture of the peace Jesus brings. So Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything he had, showing that he accepted Melchizedek's authority. This hints at what's to come with the priesthood in the future. So even though Melchizedek might seem mysterious, he's like a sneak peek of Jesus, the ultimate priest, the 24 elders. The Bible talks about many mysterious beings that have intrigued people for a long time. One of these groups is the 24 elders. These elders are mentioned in the book of Revelation, which describes a magnificent throne room in heaven. It's a place filled with divine light and power, where the most powerful being in the universe lives. The Bible figure John had a vision of this throne room while on the island of Patmos. 
he saw 24 elders sitting on thrones around the main throne, wearing white robes and golden crowns. These elders and other creatures worshipped God, saying He is worthy of glory, honor, and power, because He created everything. Although the Bible doesn't provide many details about the 24 elders, some believe they represent the church. They're not considered angels because elders is usually used for older men who can lead the church. Angels don't age, so they wouldn't be called elders. Also, the elders wear white robes and golden crowns, symbols often associated with believers, not angels. The cherubim, another group of heavenly beings who worship God constantly, motivates the elders to worship God. In the Old Testament, elders were respected leaders of God's people and were seen as believers' representatives. They wear crowns of victory and have gone to the place prepared for them by their Redeemer. So the 24 elders are mysterious figures in the Bible, representing believers who worship God alongside other heavenly beings in the throne room of heaven, the death angel. You might have heard about the angel of death, but have you ever wondered about a death angel? In Exodus, things get intense. The Egyptians weren't letting the Israelites go, and God decided to bring some serious plagues, with the last one being the worst. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I'll bring one more plague on Pharaoh and Egypt, and then he'll let you go. This final plague involved the angel of death. Moses told Pharaoh that at midnight the Lord would go throughout Egypt, and the firstborn in every house, even among the animals, would die. It was a heavy message. Picture this. It's midnight, and there's a great cry throughout Egypt. Every home without blood on the door faced sorrow, but the houses marked with blood were spared. The Hebrew people believed in Moses and followed God's plan, and that night became historic. As the clock struck midnight, the angel of death did what was foretold. Every firstborn in Egypt, from Pharaoh's palace to the prisoners' cells and even the cattle, faced the consequences. Pharaoh, his servants, and all the Egyptians experienced heartache, and there wasn't a house without someone dead. The destroying angel spared no one who wasn't prepared, sticking to the Lord's word. The night was filled with the sounds of grief as a large crowd of mourning Egyptians witnessed a march toward the border. The angel of death, also known as the destroyer, played a part in this tragic night. Now here's the thing. The term destroying angel or angel of death isn't pointing to one specific angel in the Bible. It's more like a description of heavenly messengers sent by God for judgment. In Hebrews 11.28, this being is called the destroyer of the firstborn. The original Hebrew text in Exodus 12.23 doesn't mention a specific angel. It talks about the destroyer causing harm. There's another instance when a plague hit Israel and 70,000 people died. God's command stopped the angel from afflicting the people. This shows that the concept of a destroying angel isn't limited to one event, but signifies a divine force sent by God for judgment. Demons. Demons are like personal beings. They act and talk like people using words like I, me, and you when talking. The bad spirit inside someone who is possessed causes the possession. Demonic possession happens when a demonic spirit lives in a person's body and shows its own personality through the person. People might get involved with demons by doing things like fortune-telling or other occult practices. These things can trick believers and be dangerous for non-believers. Also, they want to use bodies like weapons to attack God. They try to ruin the image of God in people by making them look ugly. Demons also try to wreck the image of God in Christians, but their power is limited because of what Jesus did on the cross. Even though they can deceive Christians and make them doubt, demons were disarmed by Jesus on the cross. Demons have names. In Luke 8.30, Jesus asks for a demon's name. The demon says its name is Legion because many demons were in the man. It's important to know that Legion isn't a real name, but it used to be scary and threatening. Not only this, they can talk and communicate. They spoke with Jesus, and Jesus talked to them. When Jesus was casting them out, they begged not to be sent to the abyss, which is like a bottomless pit. This abyss seems like a place where certain demons are kept. Demons have a will, 
and they appealed to Jesus not to send them there, but to let them go into some pigs. Jesus had authority over them, and they had to obey. Lastly, demons are intelligent beings. They know who Jesus is. In Acts 16, 16, 17, a demon-possessed girl follows Paul and the others. The spirit inside her allows her to speak things about Paul's ministry. Demons are spirit beings without a physical body. They belong to the spirit world and show themselves only by causing problems. There are different levels of evil among demons, and Jesus showed his authority by defeating them, setting people free, and defeating Satan's plans. The Leviathan Human pride and greatness seem insignificant compared to the Leviathan, a fearsome aquatic creature described in the Bible. The Leviathan is portrayed as a formidable beast with immense power and ferocity, symbolizing the untamed forces of nature. The Hebrew word for Leviathan means coiled or twisted, emphasizing its mysterious and fearsome nature. In Isaiah 27-1, the Leviathan is depicted as a serpent that the Lord will punish. Its strength and wildness were well known, and it was revered as a creature of the sea that glorified God. Although some interpretations suggest the Leviathan could be a mythical sea monster or dragon, others view it as a powerful crocodile or even an ancient dinosaur. In Job 41, God describes the Leviathan in detail, emphasizing its size, strength, and untamable nature. The passage challenges Job's inflated view of himself and demonstrates how small and powerless he is compared to such a creature. Job's cursing of the day he was born reflects the intense fear and awe inspired by the Leviathan. Whether the Leviathan is a mythical creature or a real animal known to ancient people, its depiction serves to highlight humanity's insignificance in the face of God's creation. Job's encounter with the Leviathan reminds him of his limitations and the need for humility in God's presence. Lucifer A character named Lucifer is mentioned in Isaiah 14. The word Lucifer has Latin roots, meaning one who brings light, and the Hebrew translation is morning star. In any language, Lucifer was portrayed as a radiant and majestic being. He held a high rank among God's angels alongside Michael and Gabriel. However, Lucifer made a serious mistake at some point. He challenged God, and as mentioned in Luke 10, 18, he fell from heaven like a flash of lightning. Lucifer, also known as Satan, continues to act as a master of slander or tail-bearing. His goal is to undermine various forms of authority established by God in both the church and the world. When Lucifer was cast out of heaven, he didn't stop rebelling. Instead, he set up his own kingdom in opposition to God's kingdom. His downfall originated from pride. Lucifer's heart was filled with pride because of his beauty, leading to his expulsion from the mountain of God. The original sin committed by Lucifer was pride, and this sin occurred in heaven, not on earth. It wasn't related to alcohol, adultery, or lying. It was a matter of pride. Pride remains the most lethal of all sins, and many churchgoers may overlook its dangers. While some may avoid adultery or getting drunk, they can easily be seduced into pride without recognizing its harmful consequences. Lucifer, once a lovely and powerful being, succumbed to pride, leading to his transformation into Satan. Despite receiving power, authority, beauty, and wisdom as gifts from God, Lucifer's wrong attitude turned them into instruments for his own destruction. In Isaiah 14, 12, 15, the prophet analyzes the motive behind Lucifer's rebellion. His desire was to be on the same footing as God, considering himself so intelligent, beautiful, and majestic that he thought, I could be God. Lucifer undermined the loyalty of one-third of God's angels, luring them into his rebellion and fall. Scholars generally agree that Lucifer was in charge of orchestrating heaven's worship, being a musical master who continues influencing music and enchanting people. Lucifer, once in charge of God's sanctuary in heaven, overseeing religious services and guarding the location of God's presence, rebelled and fell due to pride. His treacherous angels also fell with him. Despite being the wisest and most beautiful of God's creatures, his heart was lifted up in pride, leading to his downfall. 
Satan's counterattack against man, the visible representation of God, stems from his enmity against both God and humanity. Satan aims to attack God's image in man, making war against the very image of God within humanity, working tirelessly to defile, destroy, and humiliate it. So, what do you think of these mysterious beings in the Bible? Comment below and subscribe for more.